American automakers are leading the transition to electric cars. And while we may be ahead in technology innovation, we do not own the supply chain. China does. At the heart of an electric car is its battery, made from metals sourced from around the world in a supply chain stretching 50,000 miles. And after decades of deliberate industrial policy, China now controls the battery materials supply chain. So what can the United States do? Accept our dependence on China and learn to live with potential supply chain disruptions? No, we can't build an industry with this vulnerability. Work with our allies to develop an alternative, more secure supply chain? Yes, but it won't be enough. China owns nearly every contract for the future supply of key metals, like nickel. Could we look beyond conventionally mined metals? Recovering metal from scrap and electronic waste is crucial and may solve our problem in the long term, but it won't be enough in the next 30 years, which is why it may be time to look beyond land-based mines. 1,500 miles off the coast of California is the world's largest known deposit of battery metals. Nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese all packed into a single rock. These polymetallic nodules can be collected and brought to American soil and processed by American companies. It's a path to make real progress in solving our supply chain problem by making the battery materials at the heart of electric cars at home. So I believe one of the most promising solutions to the battery material supply chain problem that's been spoken about lies 1,500 miles off the west coast of the USA. Greenpeace don't agree with me. They would rather we not start a new extractive industry in the ocean. And intuitively, that makes sense. But I would ask you to just hold on to that intuition for a moment, for the next 10 minutes. As we've heard, metal supply is a complex, multi-dimensional problem. And of course, it's a little bit like a Rubik's cube. And ocean health is, of course, one of the very important issues. But there are other issues that need to be taken into account. And resource is one of them. This resource is like having three tier one world-class assets combined, a world-class nickel, copper, and manganese mine all in one. And of the 17 licenses, uh, sorry, 19 licenses in the CCZ, we have identified 1.6 billion tons of these rocks on just two of ours, enough to electrify the entire USA light passenger fleet. So size matters, and if we look at what's located in the CCZ, it's an order of magnitude larger than all of the free trade countries of America when it comes to nickel, cobalt, and manganese. And grade matters because on land, we're being challenged by the falling grade of particularly nickel and copper. And grade matters for a couple of reasons. One of it, of course, is economics. But the other reason is impact you have to move a lot less dirt compared to on land. And scale matters as well. I mentioned 1.6 billion tons. That's enough to electrify 280 million 75 kilowatt batteries on an 811 NMC chemistry. There are, of course, other deposits being talked about, but they don't offer the scale to solve the problem. And so we can turn a 50,000 mile supply chain into a 1,500 mile supply chain by collecting these rocks and shipping them straight to the USA. Now, when you outsource mining to other jurisdictions, you're putting a lot of faith in their ability to regulate, particularly around environment. We are regulated by a body known as the International Seabed Authority, 
represented by 167 countries plus the European Union. Technology. Last year, we completed a six-month pilot harvesting trial where we deployed our, our production vessel, the Hidden Gem, and collected nodules for four months on our license area. It's TRL-8, it works. In fact, if we wind the clock back 50 years, these nodules were being collected by such names as Lockheed Martin and Shell and BP and Mitsubishi. And the technology was solved then. But of course now, we have benefited from the advancement of the oil and gas industry. So the technology works. Production vessel on the floating on top, robots crawling on the seafloor. We've also completed our onshore pilot processing work here in North America and Canada. So we've turned nodules into battery materials, into sulfates, into copper cathode. And amazingly, one kilogram of land-based nickel can generate 500 kilograms of waste. We generate zero waste and zero tailings. And the economics are really important. If we look at this on a, as a nickel project, about half of our revenue comes from nickel, it means that the byproducts of copper, cobalt, and manganese generate more revenue than our total cost of operation. So it means we can sustain fluctuating metal prices. So biodiversity, and ecosystem function are two things that we worry about. If we remove nodules, what about the obligates who depend on them? What about the noise that we generate? What about the sediment that gets generated on the seafloor and in the midwater where we return our water? Well, when it comes to biodiversity, the good news is that already there is much more area protected in this part of the ocean than there is under exploration around 2 million square kilometers protected, and around 1.2 million square kilometers is under exploration. And for some of the other environmental questions, it comes down to research. And this area has been researched from an environmental perspective since the 1960s. There are more than 150,000 papers that talk about environmental impacts. We have spent more than 700 days on our license area with a focus on environmental impacts, establishing baselines so we could monitor the impacts as we move into the production phase. And just recently, we submitted a very large dump of data, and we've collected around 200 terabytes of data over recent years which is going to help the world come to a better understanding of this ecosystem and our potential impacts. And we're benefited by working with some of the world's leading independent institutions who are, who are part of our science program, who are free to publish their results. What you're seeing here is a nodule field with a harvester crawling along the seafloor. And you can see how we lift the nodules. You don't go to the bottom of the sea and dig up and churn. We use an engineering principle known as the Coanda effect. And this is what it looks like once we've collected rocks. You'll notice it's an area that has no flora and 80% of the fauna is bacteria living amongst the sediment. So scale matters. These squares represent our oceans. So 70% of the planet. And the red area is the area impacted every year by seafloor trawling, around 5 million square kilometers. And the navy area is what will be impacted 
between now and 2050 by offshore wind. And the little blue area, and I apologize it's so small, is a reflection of if 50% of all of the exploration contracts move into production, the annual impact on seafloor. We have to look through the lens of a life cycle analysis and recently we engaged benchmark mineral intelligence to carry out an LCA looking at impacts of collecting nodules, which you can see here on the right hand side. And on the left hand side is Indonesian rainforest nickel, which is where 50% of the world's nickel is currently coming from. And this illustrates what happens when you use um, um, smelting function to turn it into nickel material. So across every impact, we can massively compress the environmental impacts. And what about other forms of nickel outside of Indonesian rainforest nickel? We win on those factors as well. And you can find all of that material on our website. But there are some impacts that you won't see and don't get talked about enough. And they're the impacts that are going on every day. And we can't ignore those impacts when we make a conscious decision about is it the right thing to be going to the oceans to, make, to generate our battery metals. There's no, rain, there's no rainforest to destroy in our area. There's no risk of any child labor or human rights violations. And there's no impact on sequestered carbon. But science is helping us get to the truth. And science-based evidence is what we have to rely upon. So, it's a complex issue. And I think when we look at all of those aspects, we have to give ocean metals the chance it deserves. If you got me. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Gerard. I have a, a question for you. Um, so many environmental organizations, you mentioned Greenpeace, uh, Germany, uh, WWF, are opposing deep sea mining. Um, it's been published that many companies now, VW or BMW or Google, have said that they will never use this for their batteries. Um, Twelve governments have said that they want a moratorium on this. And right now, um, which will make it very difficult uh, for the International Seabed Authority to begin permitting, if people don't know, they are now uh, meeting in Jamaica and talking about this. What do you say to critics who say there's no future for deep sea mining and investors who would be wise to look elsewhere? Well, firstly, a small correction. Um, those companies who joined the uh, moratorium really have said until there is more research around the impacts, they won't use ocean metals. Um, I'd just say, we had never spoken to a single name on that list before they came to that decision. I would take a look at the companies that are not on that list, which of course is by far the majority, and some of those companies we are now talking to. And the dozen countries have a degree, some are looking for precautionary pause, but what they are doing is working towards better environmental regulations that safeguard the marine environment. And that is something that we absolutely support and we've now invested hundreds of millions of dollars towards that cause. And so you can't say that you want more science on one hand and then promote a precautionary pause or a moratorium on the other because it's companies like us that are funding the science and thankfully our shareholders. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.